We're going to talk a little bit about the criteria for suspecting CTE in individuals, what's called the traumatic encephalopathy syndrome that was published first five years ago and is in the process of being updated. And we're also going to then focus on the management of CTE. While we can't treat the underlying disease at this point in time, we can manage the symptoms and improve the quality of life for individuals. And we certainly recommend that all people with CTE symptoms be undergoing treatment. So if we can kind of hit that slide deck, Tyler. Maybe. <laughs> I don't think we need that one. <laughs> we can pass beyond that. <clears throat> when we talk about concussion, I think everyone on this webinar knows that concussion is a type of traumatic brain injury caused by rapidly accelerating the head, either directly from a blow to the head or indirectly, uh, snapping the head back in a whiplash-like manner. And most people with concussion have short-term symptoms lasting hours, days, or weeks, but some people have symptoms that go on to months any, and sometimes years. When the symptoms go on to years, certain, well, pardon me, when the symptoms go on beyond a month, we call it post-concussion syndrome. And sometimes post-concussion syndrome symptoms can last years, not commonly. On the other hand, rather than a traumatic brain injury, CTE is a neurodegenerative disease process in the same category as Parkinsonism or Alzheimer's disease, other neurodegenerative diseases. It's linked to repetitive head injury especially, and also brain injuries, including concussion. Classically, it shows up years after one has stopped taking the head trauma and the symptoms in most cases are progressive. Not in every case though. We see in the next slide, the growth in terms of our knowledge about CTE that's out there in the media is quite rapid over the last, especially 10 years. Whereas the science with CTE has been, as science always does, increasing at a slower pace. But as we see in the next slide, that whereas the media exposure continues to go, the science has really exploded with CTE as well. Back in 2007, as we see in the next slide, when uh, the Sports Legacy Institute was founded and then the CTE Center at BU was formed in 2008 and then the first paper about CTE came out of that center, um, there were only about five publications a year on CTE. And now, as we've seen from 2015 to the present, uh, there are more than 100 publications a year. So the publications about CTE, the science with regard to CTE, uh, has rather exponentially increased. The next slide simply points out the first paper that we were a co-author with our colleague Andrew Budson uh, on, on the management of chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And in that paper, we talk about uh, how we diagnose people that we think are at risk for traumatic encephalopathy, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, and then how we manage their symptoms, how we actually uh, treat those symptoms. The next slide points out that CTE has been known for a long time but it's certainly much more prevalent than we ever suspected it. And we've, through the publications, especially in the last 10 years, uh, that's been quite widely distributed. It's only able to be diagnosed neuropathologically, so anybody who is alive um, can be suspected of having CTE based upon some criteria that I'll mention in a moment, but we can't be 100% sure. But when they have the reasons for suspecting it and when they have the symptoms that are consistent with it, then we treat those symptoms and manage those individuals as CTE suspected individuals. The next slide points out that 
the early detection of CTE symptoms right now, the CTE itself cannot be uh, diagnosed with certainty, but we can have a very high index of suspicion. And the index of suspicion, as the next slide shows, is based upon what we call the traumatic encephalopathy syndrome. This was first published about five years ago, has had a number of upgrades and is currently being revised even as we are talking today with um, a paper to be submitted in May with the, the latest iteration of it. But basically the first three criteria must be met for one to be given the diagnosis of traumatic encephalopathy syndrome. And when you have this diagnosis, you certainly are at risk for having CTE, and the risk falls into two categories, probable or uh, possible. Uh, we can't get to the uh, probable in most cases because there aren't as yet um, diagnostic studies that are definitive for it, meaning imaging studies or biomarkers. Um, so to receive a TES diagnosis, the criteria that must be met are number one, a substantial amount of exposure to repetitive head trauma, not a single brain injury or even two big brain injuries, but repetitive head injuries. And in most cases, we're talking about thousands of repetitive head injuries, the subconcussive bows that go along with our collision sports. Secondly, core criteria must be met. And although it was not always in all of the publications, the latest is that the core criteria must include cognitive impairment and there may or may not be neurobehavioral dysregulation. If both are present, we call it a mixed traumatic encephalopathy syndrome with only cognitive issues are present, we call it a cognitive form of traumatic encephalopathy syndrome. Also to meet the criteria, the symptoms must be best explained by the repetitive head injury and not by some other neurodegenerative disorder. And they're also, in many of these individuals, uh, will have evidence of dementia, but the dementia itself is not essential for the traumatic encephalopathy syndrome. The next slide points out that for the exposure, we have hundreds and hundreds of cases with individuals that played football whose brains have been studied that have been proven to have traumatic encephalopathy syndrome and of which we have the data in terms of what their symptomatology was. So in terms of the exposure, we have it pinned down scientifically for football. We don't as yet have enough cases that we can say what the exposure needs to be for military exposure, IEDs for instance, or for other contact collision sports. The next slide indicates that the first paper that was published um, a few years back in the Annals of Neurology with Jesse Mez showed that sports in the terms of our football experience, next slide, if individuals play football at the National Football League level and then their brains were studied at our uh, facility, essentially 99% had CTE. At the college level, it was roughly 99% and in a smaller number of high school football players that we looked at, 14% had CTE. Jesse also led another paper, next study, that showed that individuals, this is a, a paper that was just published in the past year in the Annals of Neurology, again, looking at 223 individuals with CTE and clearly found the same strong dose relationship with CTE neuropathology. If we look at the next slide, it indicates that the odds ratio of developing CTE in football players went up every two and a half years. And most importantly, if individuals played football under five years or under four and a half years, 
they were one tenth as likely to have CTE as individuals that played greater than 14 and a half years. Clearly a dose response. Also in this group, almost nobody had CTE that hadn't played football five years. And so the criteria in the next slide for uh, how much exposure you need to have, well, the more you have, the greater the risk, but a minimum of five years exposure in football. In other sports, as I said, we don't have definitive numbers. When we look at individuals with CTE, we look at the symptom checklist and we score at the bottom of that symptom checklist, um, the cognitive symptoms they have, the behavioral symptoms they have, the mood symptoms they have, the motor symptoms and the vestibular ocular. And the next slide, shows these same symptoms broken out into those different domains. We also use these domains not only to diagnose the syndrome of traumatic encephalopathy syndrome and therefore who's at risk for CTE, but we also focus the treatments based on the constellation of symptoms that one has. The next slide talks about CTE management and, and in terms of the evaluation for individuals with CTE, there is a very detailed neuropsychological battery that not only tests extensively with a number of cognitive tests, focusing on executive function, learning and memory, language, visual spatial ability, their dementia rating scales, there are a number of different mood uh, scales and a number of behavioral scales as well as sleep. And most importantly, to make the syndrome, you not only have to have the symptoms consistent with the cognitive decline, but you have to have neuropsychological testing that proves it, and the level is 1.5 standard deviations below normal. So it's a fairly significant drop in one's cognitive functioning. The next slide talks now about what I'd like to focus on, which is CTE management. For virtually everybody with CTE symptoms, two things should be part of one's treatment of the disease, and it should be thought of as medicine for those individuals. One is proper exercise, because we know that the more exercise one has, it has a very positive effect, not only on us emotionally in terms of reducing anxiety and reducing um, um, our elevating our mood, but it also has a very profound effect cognitively. We think it's primarily due to neuroplasticity and trophic factors, neurotrophic factors that enhance our intellectual function. That's a work in progress in terms of definitively working it out, but the early research is pointing that direction primarily. The other thing is diet. Everybody should be focused on a diet that is uh, high in green vegetables, lots of vegetables, lots of fruits, lean uh, meat if you uh, are uh, one who likes to consume meat and stressing uh, uh, fish in the diet. And then depending upon what domain of symptoms, as we just showed you the different ones, you primarily have. If you're problems are primarily cognitive or in a major way are cognitive, then cognitive therapy is going to be a very major part uh, of your treatment. If on the other hand, it's behavioral issues that are the major uh, grouping of symptoms or a significant part of it, then cognitive behavioral therapy, which can include mindfulness, meditation, uh, is going to be part of the therapy. If on the other hand, you're having balance vestibular or ocular issues with double vision or difficulty with eye tracking, then ocular therapies and vestibular therapies are going to be used. On the other hand, if you're having motor symptoms that are primarily in the Parkinson category of slowness of movement called bradykinesia or rigidity, uh, then physical therapy is used. And all these individuals should be worked up endocrine-wise because a very small percent will be shown to have 
pituitary insufficiency, and when that is found, um, identifying whether it's thyroid hormone or growth hormone um, or testosterone and giving hormone replacement for those individuals with low levels can produce dramatic and rapid improvements. Next slide simply shows graphically some of the different therapies. In addition to those that I mentioned already for the ocular issues and the cognitive issues, many of these individuals will have uh, headache is a major complaint. Many of them with in a, adjacent with neck pain, especially neck pain at the very top of the neck that radiates up the back of the head to the uh, top of the head or to the back of the eyes. And these individuals often are improved with cervical genic headache assessment. And then finally, if these therapies have not been useful, then we use pharmacology. And the most widely used medications uh, for the cognitive symptoms in these individuals suspected with CTE uh, are Aricept and Nemendia, which is also the therapies that is used with Alzheimer's disease. But we've also individually and with many patients found that the methylphenidase, the same medications that we use for post-concussion syndrome has been very helpful for these individuals as well. On the other hand, the heightened explosivity, the behavioral uh, impulsivity issues, as well as the mood issues with anxiety and agitation are often helped by medications that are useful for these conditions uh, in individuals that may not have those symptoms from uh, suspected CTE, so Lexapro, Zoloft, uh, Depakote, et cetera. In the next slide, we see that the pseudobulbar symptoms respond best to nodexia in most people. Depression is treated with excitalopram, Zoloft, Cymbalta, Prozac, among other medications. And then finally, there are medications which can be used to treat the sleep symptoms. Most of these people have trouble falling asleep most of these people have trouble getting enough sleep. They wake up more times at night than they did before their onset of symptoms. We start everybody with melatonin, which is a naturally occurring substance in the body, uh, and therefore virtually no side effects. But when melatonin is not sufficient, then other medications uh, that you see here uh, are all uh, judiciously used. And I use the word judiciously because any sleep medication has the strong uh, problem of possible addiction to the medicine or having difficulty getting off it. So we don't ever uh, involve these other medications without considerable thought. Chris, that's kind of a starter of going through how we evaluate who's most at risk for having CTE. One of the things that we um, mentioned before, but I wanna heighten, is we don't know the incidence or prevalence of CTE because not everybody studied for it. In fact, a very, very small percentage of our athletes and other individuals has been studied for. But we do know that it's certainly more prevalent than we ever thought. Um, we also know that our sample of individuals that we see at BU, that many of those brains came uh, from your efforts, um, these are individuals with symptoms, so it's a heightened uh, likelihood that they're gonna have CTE when they die, and that's indeed exactly what we have found. But individuals suspected of having CTE because they meet the traumatic encephalopathy syndrome, certainly there are therapies out there, and we recommend that they be used. 